Today we're doing something we've never done on Go and Be. We are drawing questions from our studio audience with Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife. We're answering all of your questions about intimacy, sexuality, and how to approach it with light and goodness in this world. Join us today on another episode of Go and Be. Welcome to Go and Be. I am your host, Christy Gardner, joined by our host, Michelle McCullough, and our guest, the esteemed, the wonderful <laughs> Jennifer Finlayson Fife, a Latter day Saint sex therapist, and one of the people who has been contributing to the last six episodes in our series of Strengthening Family Relationships. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we're doing something we have never done before on Go and Be. First of all, we have a studio audience. <laughs> yeah, you can. Uh -huh. <laughs> they have been here for the duration of the series, but the real part of that full sentence is that they have supplied questions. Um, we are going to open them up and read them, and then she is going to answer them on the fly. <laughs> and I have been practicing my big girl words for six weeks for this, <laughs> because I knew the previous episodes were going to be fine, but I knew you guys were going to put big words in here, and you did. Okay, so we're going to dive into this. We're going to see how many we can answer in the next 45 minutes. Welcome to the show. And Michelle has decided that if she's not capable of reading one of them, <laughs> I will read it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Question number one. What do you do when the high desire partner feels shame or guilt when they desire things the other spouse doesn't agree with? Hmm. Compromise? Question mark. Okay. Good. I'm trying to be succinct so we can get through lots of questions, but take your time. Um, yeah, it's natural to feel shame or guilt when you can't get the validation of your spouse. Like we, we want to suggest an idea and have them say, fantastic. And a lot of times they may be like, wait, you want to do what? You know, so it's not strange that the lower desire spouse may be anxious about it. The goal is for you to take if you're the higher desire person to really think a lot about, am I asking for something that really isn't good? Like, am I asking for too much? Or is it okay that I want it even if my spouse doesn't? Because you don't have to make it happen, but you also don't have to apologize for desiring it. I think th there's this balance sometimes in partnerships that's important, which is being able to kind of hold the dignity of who you are and what you desire, even if your spouse sees it differently or wants differently. And you don't have to get their validation or push your desire away. You can just hold its legitimacy while respecting their choice or their desires. And oftentimes, you know, when your spouse is holding on to the dignity of something they want, if you're the lower desire person, you might eventually be like, actually, I kind of would like to try that. You might eventually kind of grow into the idea or think that that's something that appeals to you, especially if it hasn't been shamed or pressured or anything. So, yeah. yeah. As a follow-up, how do I not shame my spouse or how would my spouse not shame me if I am the higher desire partner and maybe suggesting something they don't want? Right. Well, I think the reason we want to shame is when we feel anxious or we want our spouse to see things the same way. So the way we handle that is rather than tolerate, I'm married to a person who's different than me and sees things differently and wants different things, we, we handle it by trying to pressure them into the shape that makes us comfortable. And that's always a bad move. So you have to see, I'm doing something that's not decent. Now I can share my view. The reason I don't like it is for A, B, and C. The reason I don't want to do it is D, E, and F. You can, you can share who you are, but you don't have to shame the other person for seeing it the way they see it. I like it. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Okay, Going back next. next. <laughs> I have had several experiences where I thought I was very clear on a concept regarding sexuality. But then later, when I hear my kids talk about it, I realize they completely misunderstood it. <laughs> what is a way to check in without making it funny or awkward? Well, I mean, of course, when you hear them say it the wrong way, you're like, okay, well, actually, let, <laughs> let me explain. I, that's not quite it. And, you know, you, that's obviously good if you hear them saying something and you see that they've misunderstood. But you could also explain that, something to them and then perhaps the next day say, so if somebody were to ask you, you know, whatever the thing was you were discussing, 
how, how would you explain it to them? So you could just ask them to try and articulate how they understand it. And they might be like, wait, why, mom? Well, I just want to see, you know, have I explained it in a way that makes sense? And do you understand it? So you're just like a good teacher. You're kind of feel, you know, feeling out how is it received. Hmm. I'm trying to think if there's any other thing I might say. Yeah, and I think just tracking what they're saying or thinking and just correcting them if you think they've gotten it wrong. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. What practices can we put in place so we feel empowered in our own sexuality before or aside from being in a relationship? Uh, good. I'm trying to think of the practices. I mean, I think it's just being in a cherishing relationship to your body. You know, I think so much of our culture is about judging our bodies, critiquing our bodies, saying we should look a certain way. You know, it's just a way in which we kind of objectify ourselves. And so I think, you know, being, just being cherishing of your embodiment and its sensuality and its capacity for pleasure. One of the practices I uh, teach in my classes is that, you know, every day that you're, you know, getting undressed and if you're in front of a mirror, to just look at some aspect of your body that you appreciate, that you're grateful for, that you find aesthetically beautiful and to do the opposite practice of not that critiquing and judging, but valuing and esteeming. It's like having that solid relationship with yourself is really essential for being strong, for being at peace. It's also really essential for being in a meaningful relationship if you are at some point. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> I haven't used any of my big girl words yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna use one. <gasps> I've never had an orgasm. Is there something wrong with me? No, nothing's wrong with you. And, you know, the research is as women get older, the percentage of women that is pre-orgasmic goes down. So that is to say, over time, women figure out how to orgasm. Um, it doesn't mean something's wrong with you. The, to be biologically unable to orgasm is ex extraordinarily rare. There's oftentimes meanings or realities that are happening that make it unlikely that you'll orgasm. So, you know, you can f buy books. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the names of some of these books, but they can teach you, you know, more about orgasm, about female orgasm and how to better achieve it. There's both the kind of quality and quantity of touch. So the clitoris is the, what you need to stimulate to ultimately achieve orgasm. Arousal comes first through touching of the whole body and ultimately as you become more aroused, touching of the clitoris. But um, it's also the meanings in your mind. And sometimes when I ask women to tell me what are the meanings in their mind, they're often harsh and critical and judgmental and fear-based. And so they're kind of anti-erotic meanings. They're meanings that work against arousal and pleasure. Like, you know, what's wrong with me? Maybe I'll never orgasm or fear of orgasming. Sometimes people are afraid if I do orgasm, I will lose all my choices in the marriage, right? Or fear of actually being strong. You know, it's been sort of surprising for me, but some women who've grown up with mothers who always sort of played small, they're afraid to kind of step into their strength. And so they actually are afraid of stepping into their sexuality. So looking at the meanings that are in your mind is really helpful because they can often be pushing down on the possibility of orgasm as opposed to being expansive meanings, self-valuing meanings, meanings of courage, meanings of strength. Those are the kinds of meanings that make it possible. And you know, especially if you've put the brakes on your sexuality for years, it takes a little while for your body to trust you and to start opening up. So being kind to it, being patient with yourself, um, as you as you continue to experiment, but you know you're worth that time, and this is a gift from our parents in heaven. It's a resource for you, and you absolutely can achieve that if you know with some perseverance on your side. I don't think you should measure yourself by the orgasm because you can't control it. That's a reflex, but you can, if you're going to measure yourself, measure yourself by your courage, and your investment in your own happiness and your own. Um, strength. Okay. 
I'm concerned that my mental health struggles, anxiety, um, will always be in the way of full sexual experience with orgasms. How can I experience mental health lows with sexual highs? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, um, one of the challenges of having you know, depression and anxiety is if you're on antidepressants or anti-anxiety meds, they often have a dampening effect mm. on sexuality. Um, on the other hand, sometimes having the antidepressant or the anti-anxiety med is what allows you to be more able to embrace your own pleasure, you know, step towards that because you're not in this sort of self-critical, anxious place. So there's a bit of a balance there that can be challenging. Um, I mean, I think that it's what my suggestion would be is working specifically with the meanings, especially if it's like, look, I deal with a lot of anxiety. I deal with a lot of feeling badly about myself. I want to have this goodness in my life. I want this as a resource. I, I deserve this as a resource in my life. So can I work with the meanings around sexuality specifically that I can allow myself that that nurturance, that goodness, even as a source of strength for the other challenging realities. So I think seeing it as that, like a place for me to find refuge, find comfort, can allow you to work with the meanings around sexuality to open yourself up to it more. I would just get very specific in my thinking, because a lot of times what we're thinking, we don't, we don't track it. You know, we often have a big bully in our head who's, you know, shouting at us and saying mean things and we don't even really realize it because it's so normal. So looking at what are the thoughts that I'm having around my sexuality and my sexual pleasure that might be interfering. Mm -hmm. okay. Great answer. In some ways, kissing seems more intimate to me than sexuality with my husband. How can I get comfortable with kissing again? Yeah. Well, it is more intimate, actually. There's more um, neuroreceptors in your lips than there is in your vulva. And so you can map the mind of your spouse much more through kissing than you can through intercourse. And so, again, you know, I talked about, I think, in the women's sexuality section about how we're really mapping the mind of our spouse. A lot of times that's anti-erotic, you know, that dampens our desire because we're tracking things about the marriage or about our spouse that are disappointing to us or we don't like. And kissing can be that too. And then also sometimes in kissing, there's meanings that are playing out that you don't like. So for example, one couple that I was working with where he would, when she would sort of say yes to sexuality, he would sort of glom on, you know, like, oh, now it's my chance. And so she, feel like she was being suffocated, right? And kind of taken over. And so she would just, she just didn't want to kiss. She just wanted, because she felt like she kind of couldn't breathe. So what I suggested to her once is to like, not just be in a passive position because he sees your passivity and that invites his, his excessiveness. Maybe meet him, step, move towards him, kiss him back. And so she did do that. She sort of stepped in to be in the partnership, which made him settle down, not be so anxious, not be so, you know, what's the word? <laughs> Taking to get something and actually could feel her presence. And so he, so she actually felt more in control. That locus of control was within her. She wasn't just trying to, you know, ma manage him. And then he settled down more. And so there was more, there was less anxiety between them because she engaged and she felt more in control. And then the anxiety lessened, and so there was more ability to feel each other and for him to actually be in connection with her in a better way and her with him. So she said, like, for the first time in her life, she liked the kissing. But that's because the anxiety was getting addressed between them through her taking on more responsibility. So mm -hmm. when she said, how do I learn to like it again? Mm -hmm. Just try it. Yeah, well, maybe think about what is it that I don't like about it? What's happening that I dislike? And do I play a role in that happening that way? And could I be a better educator to my spouse? I really like it when you do this. This is not so pleasant for me. Like, can I give him information to actually be a part of teaching him what would be desirable sexuality for me? 
That's what I talk about a lot with the women I teach, which is how do I, as a woman, participate in creating sex worth wanting? Because a lot of times the sex that women are rejecting is worth rejecting, but they're also often not participating in making it something that, that they would really like and enjoy and taking on more ownership and responsibility in having that be the reality between them. Right, because we have the expectation that our husband's just supposed to know yeah. exactly what to do. Right, poor husbands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lot to ask. And so, yeah, when we're co-creators of it and we're participants, that both gives us that locus of control, but also gives the information that allows you to create something really nice. Yeah, and my, my brain goes to, oh no, if I showed up in a way that is helping to educate, would I hurt his feelings? Well, you would if you said, hey, you idiot, don't kiss me that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if you were to say, well, you know, he could have his feelings be hurt. But I think if you're going to really be in a collaborative relationship, you're willing to kind of self-correct and know what your, what your spouse likes. And you can also say it in ways that are more about the positive than the negative. I really like it when you kiss me this way. When you do it like that, I like more than when you do it like that. So, so that you're you're using the strengths and highlighting those. And you could also say, do you mind trying it this way? I'd like to see if I like it when you do this, right? So um, it, you don't, it, it can be positive and it can be about creating a solution, not about critiquing. Mm. You always wanna think if I'm giving back feedback that it's towards the goal of achieving something better, not about punishing or making them feel bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it was either in our Connections episode or the Couples Intimacy episode where you talked about um, giving your partner the opportunity to tell them things and trusting that they want that for you. Yes. And I think sometimes, you know, you go back to cultures or to things that you put into your head, like, oh, well, they wouldn't want to know this thing about me. They would just want it. Yeah. But they actually probably would. And, a, and good men yes. would, wanna, would want to know what, what do you like? Absolutely. What makes you feel connected to me? How do you enjoy yes. being physically touched. And I Absolutely. think that would, Absolutely. knowing that going in will make it a lot easier to have those conversations. Absolutely. I mean, I think so many men really want to give their wives pleasure and they want to offer that. And so the more that they know you, the more, the more efficacious they can be, the more they can do that. Okay, Michelle, your turn. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> Very. Um, how can a person support, find, or recognize their sexuality when their partner has an addiction or a compulsion to pornography? Okay, good. Well, one of the things I think that we talked about through in some of the previous sessions is that a lot of times women are taught the idea that they're responsible in part for, their, for men's sexuality, whether that's through modesty or, you know, servicing their husband sexually. But oftentimes I work with women who feel like if I claim my sexuality am I gonna basically be leaving my post? And my post is to be watching him and making sure he doesn't go off the rails. And that's bad for both people, that idea. Because, you know, first of all, you can't control what your husband does with his sexuality. And then it means shutting down your sexuality and your sexual development because you're afraid of infecting your husband in some way. I think, now, the other part of the question, I think, is saying, you know, if I don't trust him, you know, if I'm afraid that this isn't really about me. But I think, I think that there's sort of two ideas. I'm going to see if I can hit them both. But I think that it's hard to let go of that idea that you are the guardian of your husband's sexuality. But it's a really important idea to let go of because for him to take it on himself he needs to have it be his to take responsibility for, and you stand up and take responsibility for yourself. Now, that doesn't mean that if he's functioning in an untrustworthy way that you need to trust him and bring your sexuality to him, but, but you need to know what your sexuality is, you need to be comfortable with it, and then be able to make good decisions relative to who your spouse is and how he's making decisions, but not to try and dampen yourself down for the, in the hopes that it will dampen him. It doesn't ever work. If you dampen yourself down, sometimes husbands will then say, well, I'm so resentful that she's so in control that I feel justified in indulging my sexuality and looking at porn or something like that. So it doesn't, doesn't end up working, even though a lot of us have been taught that idea. 
So claiming your sexuality is really about you and your strength and your ability to bring strength to the marriage. Is porn use on behalf of a woman or a man the responsibility or as a result of the spouse? Does it really, I guess what I'm saying is, does porn use have anything really to do with the spouse? Well, it can, but that's different than saying the spouse is responsible for it. So that is to say, you're always responsible for your choices, right? You're always responsible for how you handle your disappointments, how you handle uh, the, your sexual behavior. But there's always a context in which people are making decisions. And so I think that often if somebody's in a marriage where there is no sexuality or there's a tremendous amount of sexual anxiety, it can be an easy choice. Now, that's not me saying that, therefore, the wife is responsible for the husband's choices. But there's, you know, we play a role often in our marital troubles, but we're responsible for our choices within those marital troubles. And so it's, um, yeah, I think if it's hard on a marriage when there's no sexuality there. You know, marriage is a sexual relationship. It's like, this is the place I bring my sexuality. You're the one I choose and the one I desire. But oftentimes then our anxieties about sexuality and intimacy and letting ourselves be knowable means often we'll want to shut it down in marriage. But that is understandable, but it creates a lot of disruption within the harmony and the marriage. And so it can get expressed in these maladaptive ways. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband is a great guy, but because of the way he was raised, he's not comfortable talking to our boys, 8 and 12, about their changing bodies, sex, porn, masturbation, etc. How do you recommend that I talk to them about things I don't understand? Oh. But you probably don't misunderstand it as much as you think. I mean, when you say you don't understand, I'm thinking about that a little bit. Just in terms of, like, yeah, parts I'm that not you don't boy. have. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Well, you could read a lot about it so you can sort of speak more to it. I mean, you could also keep encouraging your spouse to have some of those conversations because as a man speaking to his sons, that would be important. And you can get more educated about boys and sexuality. But I think you can also speak to it just in the frame of emerging sexuality, um, pornography as a reality. I think you can speak to it even just knowing about sexuality as a human being and to validate that it's a good thing, that it's a good part of life. But there are lots of messages out there that they're going to encounter that could pull them away from their strength and pull them away from their better selves and, and to just talk through those possibilities with them. It might take a little bit of courage because it might feel a little uncomfortable, but I think a mother would have every ability to do that, you know, um, just speaking as a sexual being herself. And like you talked about in the talking to your kids about sex episode, you talked about helping them understand their future sexual relationships yeah. and the focus on that. Yeah. And then everything else is a driver to what do you want that future relationship to be? Yeah, exactly. And to help them make decisions relative to that end goal and that end objective. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think don't underestimate your ability to be um, a source of of good information for them, even if you're the opposite gender. What one principle that Dr. Schnarch taught you has had the most impact on your work? Mm. So this is David Schnarch. Yeah, that's right. And just for those who don't know, I've I did a lot of training with him. He died last year, unfortunately, and mm. suddenly. Well, one thing was that he said to me, and maybe I'll just tell this story, but, you know, I was, I was in doing a we would come, there'd be like 10 of us therapists and we would bring case, cases that we were working on and then we would go through the case, like what was happening with this couple and then we would role play. And so we went through my case and I said, this is what I think's happening. He's like, what do you think you need to do? I said, I think I need to do this. I need to say this to the husband. I need to do blah, blah. So then I'm in the therapist chair, we're role playing. And I start to open my mouth and I just go into kind of little girl, not really saying to the man what I needed to say. And he's like, whoa, whoa, what just happened? I'm like, he's like, I'm like, he's like, you just, you just said what you needed to say and then you, you just like went into this really weak position. And so then I'm like, okay, okay do this again. You know, get on. And then I do it again and again I go into this very weak position. 
And he's like, what's happening? He's like, you know, you have, you, you understand it, you see it, but you keep playing small. Why are you doing that? I'm like, because I'm supposed to. I'm a girl. You know? <laughs> I mean, I, that's not really what I felt. But I'm, you know, I'm just sort of programmed to go small. And he's like, why are you doing that to yourself? And why are you doing that to your clients? You have to step into your strength. They need your strength. You need your strength. Don't do that to yourself. And that was really powerful for me, like for him to be kind of confronting me about me being weak and maybe sounding nice, but not really doing what needed to be done and betraying myself. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really pivotal moment for me that playing small was no virtue and it wasn't helping my clients. It wasn't helping me. It wasn't helping anybody. And so that really pushed me to kind of push my, my courage up and to be stronger. So that had a huge impact for me. I'm so thankful that he taught you that for all that you've taught me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm grateful to him too. My young women group, the group formerly known as My Maids, have expressed frustration over being told how they dress causes boys to not be able to control their thoughts. How do you get away from this culture and thought process? Which mm -hmm. I think we talked about a little mm -hmm. bit in the Talking to Your Kids episode, yeah. but I think you should address it here. Sure. Yeah, I, I think it's the wrong message to make it about boys. I mean, you do want to make it about being respectful. And how you dress does send a message. And you want to think about, is the message I'm sending appropriate and respectful for the activity that I'm involved in? But it's not based in fear of the female body or fear of her sexuality. It's based in self-respect and respect for others. I think it's more than fine to teach girls about self-respect and respect for others in their choices. It's a way of respecting the beautiful body God gave them, the sexual body God gave them, but it's not out of fear. It's out of decency and kindness towards themselves and others. And, you know, you can talk about not using your sexuality to kind of get people's attention because it's not respectful of others, but it's also not respectful of yourself to kind of sexualize yourself to get attention or approval. So I think those are valuable messages, but don't make it about boys and their thoughts because girls don't have control over that. And it also teaches boys that they don't have to be fully responsible for their ability to be respectful around sexuality. That's very important for them to fully take that on themselves. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Do you feel like there's a minimum amount of sex that should be expected in a healthy marriage? I never really know how to answer that question because I don't really know, you know, the answer is not about a number. I think the answer is really about attending to the marriage and working honestly with the two people in it and creating something that feels good for both people and continuing to work with it until you find that reality. Because I think it is a stewardship in marriage that, that your sexuality matters. As human beings, we are sexual beings. And so being able to have a place to bring our sexuality and to love and be loved through it is a very valuable thing to do. How two people work that out, honestly, is gonna look different for some people. I mean, I, don't, I think if you say a number, then it sort of becomes like some way to judge or pressure I don't think that's the right way to think about it. I think it's more about who are you and who am I and how honest can we be about this? And, and maybe I'd like to have it more if the sex were better and how can we make it better, right? So, you know, I, I think when sex is really good, then there's not, you know, then you're kind of happy to have it whenever when it's like a really good place to go. If it's a place of feeling sustained and cared for, it's like, sure, why not? You know, why not go there? Because it's a good place to be. And so then it's not under this, like, how many times do I have to put out this week for you to be happy? You know, that's, that's a terrible meaning frame and never works well for either, either party. Okay. And there's one more. What guidelines or restrictions do you suggest parents set for their teens as they begin dating and getting into a relationship to avoid impulses that could lead to going too far? For example, like not studying dating, not being alone, curfew, et cetera. Yeah. I mean... To be honest, my kids just all hit puberty really late and I have not had to really deal <laughs> with those challenges like most parents. Like 
my kids have, or maybe it's because we talked about sex so much that they're like, oh, that's like such a parent thing. They just, they just didn't sort of challenge us on that front. So I don't have like from my parenting experience these, but I think it's, I think what you want to think about is you want your kids to have enough latitude that they can own their decisions and make choices, but not so much latitude that they can, that they can, you know, go off the road. So thinking about, you know, yeah, not dating till 16, I think is a great one. Not being alone and, and ideally double dating at 16 or just, I know we're using all the words that kids don't use anymore, but you know, mm -hmm. like going out in groups, not being alone, you know, as they get older, more time that they can actually go and be with someone, but having a curfew, just kind of, it's a way of giving a message that you matter enough for me to kind of structure your choices that you don't get more latitude than you can handle wisely. So it's a way of saying, I care and I'm attending to it. It's a way of helping them hold on to that for themselves. But it's not with a goal of like controlling them and judging them and, and, and micromanaging them because then they're going to want to rebel whenever they get any latitude. It's with the goal of really affording them freedom and trust within the, within the le level that they can handle. So I think it means thinking for, I think, the church's guidelines on that have been good. And I think thinking about who your child is and what you think works for your family. Um, I think it's also good to see like phones and so on as a privilege and something that the parents are privy to, to just be aware of what's going on with kids, what kinds of communications are they getting bullied. You know, they can step into a whole world on screens. And so they need you to be privy to that or aware enough that you can be a guide to them in that. Mm -hmm. yes. I remember being in college and I was living with my friend and her family. So her parents were there and they had siblings. And he sat us down once and he said, I've got two rules. He said, keep your pants on mm -hmm. and don't be horizontal if the member of the opposite sex is in the room. Like mm -hmm. don't lay down on the couch or don't lay down on the floor, mm -hmm. which I had never really thought about. But I can see ways that those two rules kept me out of a lot of trouble. <laughs> so I don't know if that yes. helps you. You know, <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm not sure it's the best parenting, but it worked for me. There yeah. you go. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Jennifer, as our time together over these six sessions comes to an end, I'm wondering if you would be willing, and I'm putting you kind of on the spot here, so feel free to say no, but can you share your testimony about your work? I believe mm. that every woman every man, every woman, but every one of you listening and every one of you watching has things within you, gifts, talents, and abilities that our Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother have given you to do. They've given you great capacity to change the world, to bring light and goodness here. And we can see how Jennifer's gifts have blessed our lives. Can you share your testimony about your work? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, I, you know, the one thing that has become clearer and clearer to me is that God and goodness are real and that evil and darkness is real too. And that we really are agents, that we have choices to make and to see people be up against choices and to see when people choose courageously and choose uncertainty, but choose what they feel is good, even though they're afraid, to watch their lives and their souls and their relationships expand. It's, it's remarkable to be a part of it. It's so clear that those are really real forces and that we really are constantly choosing between dark and light. And that choosing light takes courage. I mean, and it's easy to be cynical. It's easy to be resentful or justified and choose an easier path. We all do it, but we pay a price for it when we choose with our fears as opposed to choose with our courage and to believe in love and to believe in truth enough to lean into it and to let those be your anchors. It's, it's interesting because it's both an anchor at the same time that you feel that you're in uncertain territory. And so you're kind of reaching through the dark, but that pulls you into more wisdom, more knowledge, and more solidness in yourself. So it's really, 
I don't even really know how I get to be so fortunate to even be sitting here. I, I feel so privileged to be able to do this work, to be able to help people find their strength, to see what it is that they've been believing or choosing that's been interfering and to help them see a better way and then watching the fruits that come from that. And that's, um, it helps me believe in humanity. It helps me believe in goodness. It's, it's like, um, it's an antidote to a lot of the darkness because sometimes you hear about the worst in humanity and the things that people have had to endure. But that is always a source of, of courage for me is to see others' courage and to see the good things that come from it. So, you know, it's um, what we do matters. And living courageously has huge impact, that we are moral agents and we affect those people around us whether or not we want that responsibility, we have it. And so that ability and that courage to lean into what is good and to face yourself honestly and to address your limitations honestly has very um, massive reverberations for you and those that you love. And so, so anyway, I have a real testimony of that fact and how important it is to live that way. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, I've enjoyed the series as well. Thank you for watching and following along. We hope that you will share your thoughts and comments as well. Feel free to share this series with your family and friends and continue on in having some of these healthy conversations that will increase in our connections. Go and be someone who leans into relationships. Go and be someone who owns your desire and how you wanna show up in the world. Go and be. <laughs>